Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, as I said, um, I'm Joe Nash, and I work at a company called Braintree. Uh, has anyone heard of or using Braintree at all? Awesome. That's really high, actually. Um, for those of you who haven't heard of Braintree, uh, we're a company from Chicago. We're a payment processor. We were acquired by PayPal in late November uh, 2013. Um, so before I probably get started, uh, I just really want to start by saying uh, thank you for having me. Uh, this is I've been to Poland quite a few times, but it's actually the first time I've spoken. Um, and being British and ginger, I'm finding the weather a bit weird. We're currently having this going on in the UK right now. When it gets this temperature in the UK, we write news about it. So I'm struggling. I went to Tel Aviv about a month ago and I was still peeling last week. So I won't be outside. Um, one thing you may have already noticed is that I do speak quite fast. Uh, if I do happen to turn into a Super Saiyan from Essex and you need me to be quiet or slow down, uh, just give me a nudge and I can guarantee I'll probably say it at the exact same speed in the exact same accent, but we can give it a try. So. Uh, I'm here today to tell you a story about data at Braintree. Um, so I think this goes quite well with uh, some of what Zeiss was saying. He said last year about getting out of your comfort zones and trying new things. So Braintree, we're a rail shop, um, and basically we had a problem which Rails wasn't solving for us. So we reached out and we started working in something entirely new, something which is very different from anything we've worked in before, that being Clojure. So why am I giving this talk? I'm just a developer evangelist. Yes, I do some code, but I'm not a systems engineer. Uh, I don't write Clojure, I'm actually a Haskeller, though if you threaten me with torture, I will write Node.js. Um, but the main reason I'm writing this talk is because I love cool tech. So back in November, I went to the Chicago office, our main office, and I was trying to find something that was cool. Like a rail, Our Rails stack is awesome, our product is awesome, but I've seen Rails before, I've seen what that can do. I wanted something new. Um, so I was looking around, and there were some bits that caught my interest. Um, there was some Go, there was one guy doing Haskell, one single guy. He, was, he had written a build script for an internal tool. So basically, he was doing nothing important, but he tried. Um, but the interesting bit was that there was a lot of closure going on. And it turns out that what this closure was doing was actually incredibly important. Um, it kind of powered our entire thing, but this had been buried, and no one was really talking about it. Um, then uh, the guy who led this project, David Pick, did a series of talks about it, um, one of which I saw and invited me along to do this talk. So. Bearing that in mind, I do know how this works, but I'm not a closure or a data expert, so if you ask me a weird question, I'm probably going to have to refer you. So, <laughs> as I said, we are a payment processor. Uh, if you haven't heard of us, we power these people. So, the thing with these people, Uber, Airbnb, and Minecraft, is they have huge amounts of data. Does anyone know how many transactions Uber is doing a day right now? Any guesses? Five. It's one million. <laughs> so they're doing a fair amount of transactions, and that's a vast amount of data. We're talking user details, credit card details, invoices, tax details, everything. This all has to be stored. Um, and to do that, we have to deal with some certain systems. So this is all powered by Clojure right now. This is an incredibly important part of infrastructure because merchants need their data. They need to be able to do tax reports. They need to know when a transaction has happened. They need to be able to get access to that when they need it if they need to process refunds, for example. So this isn't a trivial thing, this is huge. So what we're gonna talk about is building a real-time data pipeline. So I'm gonna tell you a story of where we started from and the stages we got to where we are now to this real-time system built enclosure. So we're gonna have a bit of story time. So there isn't as many animated GIFs in this presentation as I usually like, because it turns out the hotel Wi-Fi completely kills my Mac, it just goes unresponsive. So it's, this is pretty much the only GIF, I'm really sorry. So once upon a time, we had our primary database. So our primary database is Postgres. So obviously, when a transaction happens, we need to capture that immediately. We need to store that. So that goes straight into our Postgres database. But the important part and the part where things get tricky is when we talk about our data warehouse. So our data warehouse is serves several purposes. It's for backup and duplication. So things happen in our primary DB. We hold them there. And then every now and then, they make their way over to the data warehouse where they're kind of mirrored. And it's also a single source of truth. So for example, if you're one of our data analysts who needs to construct a report on how we're doing financially, or you're a client who's trying to use our uh, dashboard API to see uh, how they're doing financially, we don't want them messing around in the primary DB. We don't want them doing queries against the database, which is powering live money. So we have this mirrored source of truth. And this is run on Amazon Redshift. Um, if you're not familiar with Amazon Redshift, basically they took Postgres, 
they forked it, and then they made it run on a huge amount of distributed machines. But the API for that makes it appear as just one machine. So your normal SQL queries just come across as, as if they're running on one machine. It's a pretty cool piece of kit, though being Amazon Web Services, it is prone to falling over, which is important later. So how we were dealing with this was we were running massive batched processes every couple of hours. So we'd have lots of transactions come in, and we'd leave them there for a bit. And then every couple of hours, we'd do this huge batch process, which would take everything and duplicate it onto the data warehouse. Um, the way we did that was basically by tracking changes to the columns. So we end up uh, to the rows. So we ended up with two extra columns, a created at and an updated at column, which is already quite a clunky method. We're having to maintain new columns in our database just to see when things have changed. But because we're a Rails app, that was actually quite easy, because Rails just makes it very easy to do that sort of thing. But this is where we kind of have the problem starting. With this massive batch update, if, it got, if we, there was a lot of transactions that day, or for some other reason it got delayed, it would be incredibly slow. And part of this was that it was also incredibly unpredictable. If there was high volume for whatever reason, say Uber have a, it rains and Uber have a fantastic day somewhere, we can't tell our data analysts when that batch update is going to be done. If they need to do a report by the end of the day and they say, oh, will the newest data be there? We can just kind of look at them and go, eh, maybe, um, which isn't great. And then the other problem is we can't track deletes. See, the problem with doing it on a column in a row is that when you delete that row, that column doesn't exist. So if we deleted a column, uh, a row, there was no way that the batch process could go and actually check that that row had been updated. So you end up with ghost data just lying around, and which, again, for analysts isn't great. If our data analysts have to compile a financial report and they've got a load of financial data that isn't actually there anymore, that's slightly awkward. And then if you happen to update the data through any means but this rail app, then you miss updates because the columns might not have been updated properly, so the updated time might not be correct. So there's a huge amount of problems here, and what those problems result in is a burden of knowledge. If you're someone who isn't one of the data systems engineers and you need to work with the data warehouse, you need to work with the data, you need to understand when that data gets there and how it gets there so you can identify problems in the data you're working with. And that's a horrible system to be in. We don't want data scientists to have to put up with knowing the ins and outs of the data warehouse and the data pipeline. The other part of the problem is that of search. So as I said, merchants need to be able to get hold of their search history. If you imagine you've got a merchant who's been on with us for seven or eight years, for some weird reason, whatever reason, they might want to go check off their transactions at the beginning of time. So we have this really cool, massive search dashboard. Um, it has about 30 tech boxes, and also, uh, let's say it doesn't work on the screen, um, and also there's a drop down which lets you select fields to do partial text matching on. Um, it's a big API, it's kind of clunky. They can do it throughout all of time, but it's really powerful. But originally, this was powered by SQL straight off of our primary database. And when you construct a, your search with this, it basically just generates a huge SQL blob and throws it at the primary database and hopes for the best. So with a small merchant, that works really nicely. When you're talking Uber, say they want to get a month of data, that's too many records to be returned. The system's going to time out. They're going to be frustrated. So we ended up imposing an arbitrary data limit on the amount they could get back. So in practice, that means, for example, you've got a huge merchant who wants a week's worth of data. They might find that our support is telling them to do seven queries, one for each day, to narrow the records down and then get it back that way, which is not a position you want to be in. So we had this problem too. So at this point in time, this is a good couple of years ago, our architecture kind of looks like this. We have our primary database feeding into our batch processes, which then goes to Redshift, and then straight off of our primary database, taking up all of our computation, which we should be using on actual process and transactions, is our transaction search. So there's a lot of problems here, and the engineering team started looking around, and they came up with some quite clever ideas. One of them was using, well, was going to try to use what would be a future feature of the Postgres itself which is that Postgres uh, actually keeps like a replication log, and they wanted to feed straight into that to be able to use that to create the uh, data warehouse. But that wasn't going to be around for a good couple of years yet. But one thing that kind of had similar functionality to that was Londist, and Londist uses this thing called PGQ, which is very imaginatively, imaginatively short for Postgres queue. So what Postgres queue is is a message queue uh, on top of Postgres, obviously, um, and this enables the messages that you want to be sent straight away to obviously be cached for some amount of time. But it has some important properties. One of those is that it's, uh, it has the ACID semantics, which we would expect from Postgres. So if a commit doesn't go through on PGQ, uh, if a commit doesn't go to disk, it doesn't go through on PGQ events, which is great. It also doesn't block the live transactions. So as we're trying to get data into our data warehouse, it's not impacting our uh, live 
our primary database. And on the other side, on the other part of the problem, the search, we're bringing Elasticsearch. So Elasticsearch was going to solve a lot of the problems. It had some issues in itself, one of them being reliability. But the main one is that it ended up being another place we had to sync data. We've got this redshift, which we have to get the same data into, and suddenly we've got Elasticsearch, which we have to get, again, this, we have to replicate the data there, but in a different way, because Redshift needs to have the shape of the data, whereas Amazon Elasticsearch needs to have the meaning of the data. It needs to know about the transactions to be able to give them back. So we end up with this kind of architecture, where we're no longer feeding off the primary database for our search, which is good. But we've now got these two things relying on PGQ, which suffers from its own problems. And those problems are that it prioritizes database integrity, which on the surface sounds like a good thing. You don't want a system to fall over and then it just nukes your entire database. But then you have the potential for lost messages. And when you're talking about transaction history, that's a very bad thing. You don't want to lose anyone's transactions. That's just catastrophic. So the main problem with it being very conscious of database integrity is that it has a very short time that it leaves things on the queue, about half an hour. And with Redshift and Elasticsearch falling over quite regularly, that doesn't give us long to get them back up. Because, I mean, Redshift, for example, falls over silently. And if it doesn't come back, if you don't realize, and you don't get back up in half an hour, that's it. You start losing PGQ messages. So we have this problem of where do we persist our messages? Where do we make sure it doesn't come along? And that's when we get to Kafka. So Kafka is this uh, part, uh, it's a system that's built by Apache and LinkedIn. And this is a distributed message queue. It's pub uh, publish, uh, publish and subscribe pattern, fairly familiar. It's kind of similar to PGQ or any other pub subsystem. It's just awesome and distributed. So you have this cluster of Kafka nodes, and you have multi-producers and multi-consumers. These are all managed by another JVM project called Zookeeper, and that just basically keeps track of the failure states. So you have Kafka nodes across multiple machines. If any one of them fails, Zookeeper catches that and makes sure that the messages get rerouted to a new machine and everything is flowing nicely. There's only one abstraction which Kafka really provides to make anything easier, and that's topics. So topics are just categories of message, and you can kind of decide the categories yourself. The thing about Kafka is it's ludicrously unopinionated, which if you can imagine that this team came from Rails, suddenly having a system which didn't care what you did is probably quite strange. Um, so you have these categories of messages called topics, and inside these topics you have petitions. So petitions are just basically like distributed logs. So they just, the messages just come onto them, and after a certain amount of time, they fall off the back. But the thing with petitions is, again, as with the clusters, they're split by machine. So you can see how this is a massively distributed system. You have cust uh, clusters of Kafka nodes across machines. They are serving categories, which are then also split across machines. Um, and with these petitions, they each serve as an individual log queue, and then you write data to them, and those make up a general topic. And there's no rules of how you write to a topic. Nothing, if, say, for example, you've got a topic with four partitions across four machines, Kafka doesn't care whether you write to top, uh, partition four on one particular machine all of your data and leave the others blank. It lets you do it how you want, which is handy, um, but also kind of dangerous, because if you do do it naively, you're probably going to do something stupid. Um, but generally, people evenly distribute them. Braintree, interestingly, doesn't. And we'll talk about why, and that's to do with the actual way we're using categories. So each message that's put onto a topic is given an offset. And again, that offset is kind of just completely unopinionated. It's just a number of where that is in the queue. And as messages fall off the back, the offset increases. Um, and the Kafka doesn't set any rules on how you actually consume from these. So if you write a consumer, you can consume any offset you want. You can consume on random offsets if you want to and just sprinkle through all the data. Um, but one of the important properties that we wanted Kafka for is that we can set our own uh, time that it falls off the queue. So with PGQ, we limited half an hour. With Kafka, we can have any time we want. And then one of the advantages of these, prop uh, of these offsets is that you can actually replay data. So for example, if you want, if everything crashed and you needed to process all the messages from the last hour again, you just tell Kafka that, and it resets all the offsets to as they were an hour ago, and you just chug along like normal. It's also strongly ordered, but only by partition. So each of the partitions is ordered in right order, obviously. But because people typically consume uh, categories by topic, they're consuming across multiple partitions, which aren't strongly ordered. So if you're consuming across a whole partition, you're kind of getting in a random order. 
that's not very helpful for us because we're using Kafka for database operations and we don't want our database events coming from random orders. That's going to lead to catastrophe. So at this point, we have this architecture. Not much has changed. Uh, we have Kafka in the middle now. We have our primary DB, but we're still using PGQ. We're now using PGQ to push messages into Kafka. So to kind of go on, I'm going to have to talk a little bit about how Braintree works. Um, it's pretty much how every payment processor works, and that is that you have a gateway. So your gateway is where transactions get processed, obviously. So it, pa it deals with the low-level banking APIs, it deals with moving through the databases, and those databases, for us, are sharded by merchant. So each merchant has their own database of transactions. And this is where we start to abuse the Kafka partitions a little bit, because we use the, each partition as being fed by a shard. So that way, we keep the strong ordering that we need per merchant. We know that transactions to that merchant are in the order they need, thus database updates are in the order we need. But this has an interesting effect on the categories. Um, we categorize by the semantics of the data. So we realized that, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, that Redshift needs the shape of our data, because Redshift has to be a database that looks the same as our primary database. But Elasticsearch, we don't care if a particular table looks the same. We just want the meaning to be there. We just want our users to be able to get their transactions. So we have two different things here. We have data and we have events. So on the one hand, we have there's this table in this database. And on the other hand, we have this transaction happened and this person got refunded. So our two topics inside Kafka become a data stream and an event stream. So when we do our partitions, what we're doing is taking uh, we have a partition in both the data topic and the event topic. And for each merchant, we're taking the uh, me messages off of, out of that database and pro putting them into the right queue by what sort of messages they are. So yeah, at this point, we've kind of done it. That would be real time. Job done. Let's go home. But one thing I haven't really covered here with all this architecture um, and all this nice the various components of our system uh, is how we actually built this, how we stitched this together. All of these systems work fine. The primary database is already powered. Kafka is a cool thing on its own. And this is where they needed to choose the tech. And they chose Clojure, as I've kind of given away already. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about the reasons for choosing Clojure. Um, so obviously, we were a rail shop. Rails isn't anything like Lisp. None of them have ever done Lisp before. Uh, they've never used the JVM before. They had no idea how to tune this thing. PayPal used to use Java, but we only acquired them. And by the time we'd acquired them, we'd changed to Node.js. So they haven't really had any experience with this before. So there's a couple of reasons they did that. The first one is actually, funnily enough, for the JVM. So the three technologies we're using here, Kafka, Zookeeper, Elasticsearch, they're all powered by the JVM. And with Elasticsearch, it doesn't really matter. It's got a HTTP uh, API. But with Kafka and Zookeeper, the only official client libraries are written, by, are written in Java. And yes, there are third-party client libraries, but you miss out on the latest and greatest features there. And that's being latest and greatest is something we're very keen on. So we kind of had to use a JVM-based language. And then the other one, this one I was very surprised about, because this is one of the few convincing industrial uses of it I've seen. Laziness, it turns out. So they wanted to use Clojure for some lazy data structures, in particular, infinite lazy streams. So where this comes in is uh, to do with dealing with concurrency, basically. So the events queue and the message queue, um, that's an infinite lazy stream. And one of the things they didn't want after processing the application code was dealing with our checking whether we've run out of messages and then blocking appropriately and that sort of thing. With an infinite lazy stream, that's all handled. They just throw the stream in this application. Uh, this processing never stops consuming. When it hits the end of the queue, it, the data structure blocks itself. It's all done. So fine. And then this also leads nicely into testing. So. The consumers that's consuming this message queue don't care whether it's an infinite list or a normal list. Um, so we can actually separate that out so that it's not our testing isn't reliant on Kafka. So we had this weird situation. Uh, I think David himself actually had the situation where they were running some unit tests that were reliant on Kafka, and they were like, OK, let's test with three events. Uh, I want three messages from Kafka. And then the test would go on for a minute and didn't seem to be doing anything, and they were wondering why. And it turns out that the test had only produced two events, uh, that only two messages had come out of Kafka. And then because it's this infinite data structure, it's just blocked and waiting. And with a test, no more data is ever going to come out of that. So they're getting no output, nothing useful. So when we divorce the testing from Kafka and from that framework, 
we're able to make our testing much easier because we can just feed it a normal list with a fixed length, with data we know. And it speeds up testing. And then concurrency. So this is kind of the main reason. But there, was m there could be many choices of language here. Um, again, we were constricted by the JVM. But we had kind of choice of three concurrency primitives. So the first one, threads. So with threads, uh, they were basically creating a single thread uh, per category. And that was feeding in uh, the messages as they came about. Um, there's a couple of problems with the way this was done. So firstly, it didn't provide any failover. It didn't provide any, like, any handling for failure. We had to do it all ourselves. We had to wrap everything in try-catches. If Redshift fell down or if Elasticsearch fell down, we were kind of stuck. And then we came from that and we thought, how about Go routines? They're green threads. We can start many more of them. And basically, what we ended up doing here was creating a Go routine for each merchant and then just having a single actual thread which took the messages from PGQ and fed them to each Go routine. But with the Go routines, we had the same problem of not having any fail management, though we did have the ability to communicate between processes. So both of these had one other particular problem, which was that of shutdowns. Obviously, if you shut the whole system down, you need to make sure that all the messages have been sent. If you shut down the f if you so what we're having to do to make sure that had happened is shut down the system, catch that shutdown, and then go check all the threads, tell the thread to finish, and then wait and see if there's er any error conditions on them finishing, then process those, and then we finally shut down. So it made starting up and shutting down the system very difficult, which is hard when you're deploying. But then finally we settled on actors, um, which are actually an Erlang extraction. Um, and Actors kind of fixed all of our problems. They allowed us to have single merchants. Uh, they had built-in shutdown logic. They enabled us to check the status of Actors while they were running. Um, I've already covered single merchants. And one of the things that they did do, which was really interesting, was they enable us to offload work to Kafka. So, for example, uh, with Go routines, we were finding that the routines were pulling in messages a lot faster than we could process them. We ended up with hundreds of thousands of messages, which was making the garbage collection explode. With uh, our actors, they're able to send a signal to Kafka, to our consumer, that says, hang on a minute, my inbox is full, hold the queue. And then Kafka would block, we'd process all the messages, and then the flow would resume. And then they also go quite nicely with an Elasticsearch abstraction. So Elasticsearch has aliases, which are basically actors. Um, and what this means is that in our Elasticsearch, all of our merchants, again, appear as single merchants. All of our data uh, is in an Elasticsearch alias for each merchant. And so we can treat our Elasticsearch API exactly the same as we treat our Kafka API. So we use those things, and we kind of built up the system, and we learned a few things from it. So the first one is that garbage collection is absolutely awful and the enemy. You want to keep it small. So you want the intervals to be as small as possible. And there's a couple of ways we found of doing that. One is to use uh, G1GC, which is a kind of newer garbage collector, which hasn't yet made it standard. And the accepting second is that heap size is really important. And somewhat counterintuitively, uh, with closure, smaller is better. Um, obviously, all the data structures tend to be immutable, and they're creating mass amounts of objects. So with a smaller interval, um, you're clearing that up faster, and then the garbage collection intervals are smaller. Um, and then thirdly, we decided to monitor all the things. So we found that one of the advantages that JVM gave us is that we can use JMX. So we could get running stats from all of our processes whenever we wanted them. We can use these compile reports and check on the health of the system. Um, and this is quite important uh, towards certain parts of our lifetime because throughout our life cycle, as merchants grow, we need to grow with them. And if we find that this is a good way of monitoring our capacity. So for example, whenever Uber gone on their growth spurts, we need to be able to anticipate that and scale up our product systems. Um, and then this is kind of true of everything, but don't use the default configs. So the default uh, time for a message to fall off the queue in Kafka is about half an hour, which I find hilarious because on their documentation, they say that Kafka petition queues are immutable, but they fall apart within half an hour. So we changed that to be about a month, I think. And again, that gets changed kind of varying depending on how much data capacity we have at the time. Um, but we changed it to very long so that we get that persistent storage that we wanted for our messages. Um, and then again, this is another ov obvious one. Use a good concurrency model, one that doesn't have race conditions. So we use actors, um, which we found kind of solved the main problems we have with threads and Go routines. Uh, and we also get some really interesting future gains from this. So we went from a batch system to a real-time system, which enables us to do some really cool things. So our source of truth, our database that everyone else in the company can access, uh, is now real-time. And that means we can do things like real-time fraud monitoring. So obviously, being a payments company, we have a huge fraud department. We check that every merchant and every user is who they say they are, blah, blah, blah. We can actually get out of our data real-time, 
analyze it for patterns, pick up on fraud, and we can start to do some really interesting things there. Um, we can also do real-time reporting, which has since turned into an API. So that search dashboard I showed you, uh, there's actually an API to construct those yourselves, and you can pull out data kind of as you want. And that API is powered by this. This has also gone on to change how our webhooks work, uh, and also basically anyone else in the company who needs to do something core of our data, they can do it. Our data analysts are really excited about this because they've now just got this huge data stream that they can do whatever they want with. So I'm about five minutes short, which is handy. So thank you very much, everyone. I've been Joe Nash. Um, so one thing I couldn't want to mention, I know some people are here. Um, have anyone heard of Battlehack? Cool, that's more than I expected. Okay, so as some of you know, uh, we came to Poland last year. Uh, we unfortunately didn't come back this year. I was kind of gutted. It turns out Warsaw turned the water off halfway through our event. Uh, so we've gone somewhere else. <laughs> but we are coming to other places in Europe. So some of you have already been to our Berlin event this year. Uh, we still got Venice and Stockholm to come. Uh, Venice is actually next week, so that might be a bit tight. But Stockholm is in uh, September, 12th and 13th. So if any of you do want to come to a hackathon, check it out. Um, it's a really great event. If you haven't been to a hackathon before or don't know what it's about, come chat to me. And yeah, with that, are there any questions? Awesome. <laughs>